This story begins with the revolution. In November 1918, German sailors left their post and marched southward in protest against getting sent off to yet another senseless battle against the British Navy that would end in a draw. The general populace and most of the army followed suit and the Great War ended together with the German monarchy that month. The following Weimar Republic was crippled by the Peace Treaty of Versailles, which dictated large territorial concessions from Germany and on top of that, reparation payments of initially about 269 billion goldmark. In today's money that would be about 900 billion US dollars, so yeah, not exactly a stable ground for any new government to function. There's little surprise that more revolts followed immediately. Communists trying to further the revolution and failing, then getting murdered for it. Socialists trying to establish an independent Bavarian state, put in their place by the army. Nationalists trying to overthrow the government, failing due to a general strike. And radical communists trying their luck in the wake of the aforementioned nationalists, persuaded of a nice cup of coffee to lay down their arms. And I'm just kidding, they got maimed by the army. And those are only the ones that happened in the first two years of the Republic. The lands left of the River Rhine, known for their significant industrial capacities, got occupied by the Entente and the entirety of the Rhineland was demilitarized. Further demands were bridgeheads in a 30 km radius along the right side of the river going from Mainz, occupied by France, Koblenz, occupied by the US, and Cologne, occupied by the British forces. It was at this point where one of the most ridiculous mistakes in recent history happened. Whether it was because of a simple oversight or a calculation error going from metric to imperial, the jerk responsible for drawing these circles messed up and instead of overlapping the bridgeheads, as it was meant to be, they left a strip of unoccupied territory between the French and the US occupied zones. At its thinnest, not broader than a kilometer, which is about 0.6 miles, and shaped like the neck of a wine bottle, which is hilariously fitting for a region known for producing wine and schnapps and nothing else. Not quite as amusing was the situation for the strip's 17,000 inhabitants, as the occupation zones around them cut off every road and railway between them, the rest of Germany, and in some cases even between the villages themselves. People weren't allowed to cross the border and trains weren't allowed to stop on their way through. Every telegram that was supposed to go to the regional government in Wiesbaden got intercepted by French officials, sometimes not even making it further than that. Berlin transferred responsibilities for the bottleneck over to Limburg, which was the next biggest unoccupied city, yet still there wasn't even a direct piece of road connecting Limburg to the bottleneck, so telegrams and cargo had to be transported over dirt roads going through the forest in the middle of nowhere. In other words, if local mayors hadn't taken over, the entire bottleneck might have stopped to death. The region made itself practically autonomous, jokingly calling themselves bottleneck free state, printing their own currency and thriving off the black market as people from the occupied zones around them tried to smuggle their possessions over the border to avoid them getting confiscated. Most of the smuggling went via boat over the Rhine. Originally there weren't any boats supposed to dock in the bottleneck at all, but unfortunately for the Entente, the Rhine back then was as irreplaceable for transporting goods as it was dangerous to ship on and all the pilots with the knowledge of the waters around the area were stationed in Kalp. Also since cargo back then wasn't transported in containers, one would hardly notice 5 or 10% missing at its destination and unfortunately the ship's crew wouldn't know either because of them being drunk of wine and schnapps they swear to god already had owned when they started their journey, why are you asking? To crack down on smuggling, the French put up giant searchlights along the river, which prompted the kids over in Kalp to walk out at night and show their blank houses at the riverbanks. In return, a group of gendarmes crossed over to hold a little speech at the Monument of Blücher, the Prussian field marshal who defeated Napoleon, before urinating at its pedestal, much to the dismay of the natives there. In defense of the average French soldier, though, one has to admit that they might not have even been aware that they just crossed the border to relieve themselves. Seeing how often the French moved their control posts around the bottleneck, borders were more of a suggestion anyway. If the French general staff would have had it their way, the entire bottleneck would have been occupied by then, but the Brits and the Americans didn't want France to get any bigger than they already were, and they had a point. France was economically crippled by a war with the German state, proclaimed in Versailles not even 50 years prior to that. In their opinion, Germany shouldn't even exist. French actions in the early 20s really only had two major goals, not going bankrupt and dismantling Germany to restore what they perceived as order in Europe. Unfortunately for them, the Allies realized that the absence of Austria-Hungary would leave a power vacuum only a stable Germany could fill, which is why they also allowed the German army to march into the neutral zone to strike down a French-funded separatist uprising, which was an infringement of the Versailles Treaty only the French really cared about. Between French and German soldiers marching in an 
out of the Rhineland at various times, the neutral zone was really more of a suggestion anyway. Over time, communication between the bottleneck and the rest of Germany normalized, also because of the US occupants being more willing to help the area than the French. A phone line from Lorch to Limburg was installed by the end of 1920, and the provisory self-government of the Free State wasn't needed any longer. Although smuggling was very much still a thing and affected all areas around the bottleneck, mainland Germany included, negatively. France only waited for an excuse to set an end to this. When the German Republic became unable to pay Alemon I mean reparations, the French army marched into the Rhineland as well as the bottleneck, only to find that any bottle of wine, or in fact key, to anything holding or capable of transporting wine or money has been mysteriously lost. Any fleeting bit of cooperation between natives and the French from there on ended when Berlin ordered a general strike in the occupied regions. A cargo train filled to the brim with coal, addressed to Italy for reparational purposes, got stuck in Rüdesheim next to the border because the engineers decided that this was the best place to drop whatever Whatever they were doing and go drinking or something like that, Italy was more of a suggestion anyway. A slight alteration of these suggestions was carried out by other engineers, seizing the opportunity to hijack the train and drive it into the bottleneck, where the locals generously offered their help to unload it. The ones responsible for distributing the coal were exiled to non-occupied Germany, alongside with any other administration personnel or expert that wouldn't acquiesce to the occupant's orders, which at this point was basically every capable person in the area, so this second occupation of German lands became a costly endeavor for France, who tried to move valuable goods over the river but barely could do so with the mounts and the infrastructure on strike. What happened after that is a subject best discussed in another lesson, because the story of the bottleneck ends here, with France marching in. Now, you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with revolution, as the title might allude to? The bottleneck never rebelled or proclaimed its independence, and the title Free State even back then was meant as a joke, and today it's more like a clever marketing campaign for the region. Maybe I just brought you this story because every time I think of it, I picture French soldiers getting mooned from across the Rhine, and it fills me with glee. Actually, I want to point out that between all the revolts and coups and attempted revolutions the Weimar Republic saw itself dealing with, the only region to actually achieve autonomy, even if it was only for one and a half years, didn't want to and only did so because administrative problems caused by a ridiculous oversight in the Treaty of Versailles made government from outside the townships dangerously impractical and inefficient. You see, this is not a story of ideology, or national pride, or class conflict. It's only about people trying to survive in a precarious situation and still taking it with humor. I think that's beautiful. Maybe you do as well. Unless you're a heartless bastard longing for bloodshed, but in that case I can actually help you. You know, this video is actually part of a grand history collaboration between about 20 other YouTubers, some of which are, unlike me, actual historians. I can wholeheartedly recommend you to check that out. Link to the playlist is in the description down below. And in case you're actually coming from that playlist, welcome. I hope you enjoyed your stay. That being said, thank you to Emperor Tiger Star for keeping you lot invested in this playlist for long enough so that I can hand you over to Hikma History. He's a good boy. Be nice to him.